include these powerful books in your library. The Holy Quran, Malana Muhammad Ali translation. Special Spokesman by Brother Jabril Muhammad. The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews by the Nation of Islam Research Department. And the following titles by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Message to the Black Man. How to Eat to Live, Parts 1 and 2. The Fall of America. Our Savior Has Arrived. Records, videotapes, and audio tapes. Subscribe to the Final Call newspaper, the most widely circulated black newspaper in the world, the Voice of Truth. Advertise in the Final Call newspaper and expose your message to an aware, action-oriented readership. Support the three-year economic program launched by the Honorable Louis Farrakhan on October 7, 1991. Designed to address the critical needs of the black community in the upcoming years, your monthly $10 contribution will help to establish farms and businesses that will meet the necessities of life and lay the foundation for our economic survival. Send your $10 a month donation to the three-year economic program, 4855 South Woodlawn Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60615. Careless lifestyles are killing us in droves across all ages. The merchants of death dump filth daily into our communities and we put it into our bodies. It is best to make the most of this life and empower ourselves through healthful living. Let me share my thoughts with you on this special video, Call Now to Order. Get Farrakhan's program for better health and the story behind his bout with cancer. To order, call now. 312-602-1230. That's what I'm talking about! At last, the hottest book of the decade is now here. A Torchlight for America by Minister Louis Farrakhan is the long-awaited book that offers true guidance and solutions to problems facing America. Written in clear, direct language, A Torchlight for America is required reading for those seeking the truth. Order your copy of A Torchlight for America. Send $12 plus $4 shipping and handling, check or money order to Final Call, Inc., 734 West 79th Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60620, or call 312-602-1230. Minister Louis Farrakhan, the man that tens of thousands come to hear all across America, presents his first ever women's only address. You are a greater treasure than any treasure that can be found in the depth of the sea. Make check or money order payable to Final Call, Inc., 734 West 79th Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60620. In the most holy name of Allah, the all-wise, true and living God who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, and in the name of his exalted Christ, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we can never thank Allah enough for blessing us with a bold, strong champion our leader, teacher, and guide in our midst today, and representative of the Christ, I speak no other than of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names again, all praise is due to Allah. In their names again, I greet you in the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language, Assalamu alaikum. Happy Savior's Day. And what a Savior's Day we are having today. How do you feel? All praise is due to Allah. We want to welcome all of you who came from near and came from far to participate with us this day which is the crowning event 
of Black History Month and the crowning celebration for we, the Muslims in the Nation of Islam, of our hard labor throughout the last year, culminating with this Savior's Day, 1995. You know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, he said, who is it that is in need of being saved, that a Savior must be born? This day, we celebrate the birth of a Savior, a Savior whom the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said loved black people so much, so much so that he would climb a mountain 40 miles high just to teach one of us, a Savior that had a love for us so great and has a love for us so great that he would eat rattlesnakes over us. A savior in whom the power of God flowed freely, came among us, walked the streets of Detroit, Michigan, and made himself known in 1930, July the 4th. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about our Savior, our Lord, God, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. <laughs> Moving right along, we want to hear from our first speaker, who is our national spokesman for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and he's also our Minister of Health, a man who should be introduced by love because that is exactly what I have in my heart for my brother and any of you that know this brother and know his tireless efforts on our behalf have nothing but sincere, profound love for him. I want you to open your ears, open your heart, and receive our brother, Minister Dr. Alim Mohammed, will you please receive him? In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the All-Wise, the True, and the Living God, we mean the one who visited the shores of North America in the person of Master Farad Mohammed whose birthday we celebrate this day, who raised from the midst of the mentally dead not one savior, not one redeemer, but two, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his national representative, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. It is in their names and in the names of righteous men and women everywhere that I greet you this Savior's Day afternoon with the greeting words of peace we say it in Arabic, Assalamu alaikum. So how do you feel this afternoon? Are you happy? Or is it just me? I don't think it's just me. I'm happy to be here. How about you? I'm happy to be a Muslim today. How about you? I'm happy to be with Minister Farrakhan today. How about you? All praise is due to Allah. We're here to celebrate the birth of Master Farad Muhammad. Yes, sir. But the thing I like about this Savior's Day is it's actually a double birthday. Because not only are we celebrating the 118th birthday or birth year of Master Farad Muhammad, this is also the 40th year of spiritual life of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. All praise is due to Allah. And just as it takes, just as it takes 40 or 41 weeks for a woman to take the seed of a man and gestate it in her womb to produce a new life, a new living human being, it takes 40 years to make a messenger of God. 
And so if you think that Minister Farrakhan has been magnificent in the past, if you think that he has been great in the past, I want you to know Minister Farrakhan is just getting started. All praise is due to Allah. I sure hope you're not coming late because I don't think you're going to find a seat in the place. We would sit you on the roof, but I think Minister Farrakhan is getting ready to raise the roof. A nation must be concerned about his health. When we look at the history of Jesus, we see that he was a teacher who went into the temples and taught the people the wisdom of God. Not only was he a teacher, but he was a preacher who taught the Spirit of God to inspire the people to get up from their present condition onto that which would be pleasing in the eyesight of God. But sometimes before Jesus could teach, sometimes before he could preach, he had to heal. Because if a man or a woman is in physical suffering from whatever disease, if a man is in pain, you can't teach him. If a sister is in mental torment, you can't preach to her. If a man is hungry, if a man is lame, if a man is deaf and dumb and blind, he may not be able to understand your teaching until you heal him. And so in his wisdom, under the guidance of Allah, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan has created now for the nation of Islam something that we call the Ministry of Health. And this ministry of health adds to the teaching and the preaching of the nation of Islam. Yes, Can't nobody preach like the Muslims. Can't nobody teach like the Muslims. And in a few more days, I think the world will bear witness that nobody can heal the illnesses and the sicknesses and the diseases of the people like the nation of Islam. We had a meeting of the Ministry of Health this morning. I didn't know how many people would respond to that call. But when we looked around, there were more than 200 doctors and dentists and pharmacists and nurses and technicians of all sorts gathered together in the room. And would all of them please rise? All of those who are workers in the Ministry of Health who are present in the audience, please rise so your nation can behold you. All praise is due to Allah. We have an army of righteous workers in the field of health. And so in 1995, Minister Farrakhan has made it very clear to me he is interested in knowing the health status of his nation. What leader of any nation is not concerned about, about the health status of the citizens of that nation. And so Minister Farrakhan wants us to emphasize certain things in 1995. And the Ministry of Health, by the grace of God, will be convening health fairs in all of the regional cities throughout the nation and in some of the other major cities throughout the nation so that we can assess the health care needs of our nation. Minister Farrakhan is concerned that there is an epidemic of prostate cancer among black men. Did you know that the number one risk factor for prostatic cancer is to be a black man in America? Think about it. Minister Farrakhan's concern is also for our women. Did you know that the number one risk factor for cancer of the cervix is to be a black woman in America, or that one out of eight black women sometime in their life will develop cancer of the breast? And so therefore, in 1995, by means of our health fairs in various cities, 
We wish that every brother and every sister would submit to these screening examinations to detect the presence of prostate cancer, breast cancer, and cervical cancer. In my conclusion, let me say, we have been put on the map by our efforts in the area of AIDS. Not only did Minister Farrakhan send Brother Abdul Wali Muhammad and myself to Kenya in 1991 to bring back alpha interferon, then called Kimron, as the greatest treatment for HIV and AIDS that the world knows about. But as we stand here in 1995, we also have the most accurate and easy to use test for HIV and AIDS a test that could be administered anywhere and give instant results in about eight minutes. Oh, we got some scientists in the black nation. This was developed by a black man in California. And it is the most accurate AIDS test that is available. And we are going to use this. We are going to use this in the nation of Islam. We are going to establish a policy in the nation of Islam that every one of us should be tested for the presence of HIV. And why do we say that? Why is that a good policy? Because if you don't know your HIV status, then you don't know enough about AIDS because the tragedy of AIDS is that you only hurt the ones you love. You say, but I'm afraid to be tested because I might be positive. Well, if you are positive, I want you to know that the Nation of Islam has produced a biochemist that is now making for us our own alpha interferon. So we can test you. We can test you, but we can also treat you. Because this is the nation of Islam, and we don't play. We are the best nation that is on the face of the earth. We might be small, but we are great, and we're going all the way behind the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. to another warm round of applause. <laughs> Moving right along, respecting time on our program, our next speaker is a very, very important individual, particularly because it's my mom. Will you open your heart and your ears and receive my dear beloved mother, Sister Tynetta Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum. Is everyone happy? We should be. A savior is born. Not only in the master who came to set the foundation for our progress, but a savior is born inside of each and every one of you. Thank you. I want to say, my beloved brothers and sisters, of not only the nation of Islam, who in reality represent all of our population of America, and even including the Native American, including our brothers and sisters of Mexico, of the Caribbean, of Latin America, of South America, of the islands of the Pacific, throughout Africa and Asia. We are a special people that were born to bring liberation, freedom, justice, and equality to the entire world. 
I feel very blessed and very privileged to be here this afternoon, 20 years ago, to this very day, it appeared that the nation of Islam went underground, a plan that was executed to undermine the divine teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And it was made to appear that the nation and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad were dead. Now, 20 years later, in this very same amphitheater where Savior's Day was celebrated in 1975, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Master Farad Muhammad, being backed by their servants, Minister Louis Farrakhan, is making Savior's Day a reality for all of us once again. What are some of the lessons hmm, that we are to learn from this experience of the last 20 years? It is to learn that Almighty God Allah was in the beginning, is and forever shall be. And no matter what evil plans are formed against us, that Almighty God Allah allows the enemy to challenge the righteous, to bring about their plan, and as we are taught by the great master himself, to leave not a stone unturned in trying, even to trying to kill the apostle. All right. We have also learned from this experience that Almighty God Allah is working with his spirit for the rise of black people in America and throughout the world. He is not going to allow the enemy to be the victor. So as we begin 17, nearly 18 years ago, retracing our footsteps through the rise of Minister Louis Farrakhan, who stood up in 1977 and said, we will not let the nation of Islam stay dormant or sleeping forever. He took upon himself the responsibility by the help of Almighty God Allah to retrace every step of the program and the divine teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad by just taking his word. And by taking his word and milking the divine essence and spirit of that word, we have come to the place where we are today. We are seeing not only the spiritual manifestation of the kingdom, but we are seeing the material manifestation of the kingdom. And that great sign was shown to Solomon, that he would build the kingdom and he asked God only for what? For wisdom. And God said, because you have not asked me for material wealth, I will not only give you wisdom, I will not only give you spiritual substance, but I will also give you material wealth. This is what we are witnessing today. Don't get jealous. Don't get envy. What you see happening to our minister is going to happen to you if you can just get envy out of your heart. This is a blessed day, Muslims, believers, and I know that before we leave this afternoon, we are going to be blessed to hear one of the most powerful messages ever delivered by a black man in the hells of North America or any place on this planet Earth or in the galaxy. But as I leave you, I want to leave you with something that was inspired to me this morning from the spirit of the 31st chapter of the Holy Quran called Luqman. Luqman 
is a black man, an Ethiopian sage, a holy man, and he wanted to advise his son on the right course to take in this world. And he told his son to be very careful of his duty to Almighty God Allah, not to make any associates to God, and to walk in humility on the earth. And he also told him not to use arrogance or proudness over the things that he would accomplish or achieve in life. So this message at this moment of our history as Almighty God Allah is bringing to us the kingdom, let us remember to be humble as our nation expands and grows and as we attain success in our lives, let us always be mindful of our duties as Muslims. Let us walk in the path of humility and submission to the will of Almighty God Allah. Let us walk in the path of perfect peace and righteousness. Let us respect ourselves and the rights of others. Let us be found truthful servants of the people, not lying, wicked examples as we have had in this world. The Quran tells us, please, O oh Allah, do not punish us if we forget or make a mistake. O oh, our Lord, lay not on us a burden as thou didst lay on those before us. And to please not impose on us afflictions that we have not the strength to bear. And to pardon us and grant us his mercy and his protection and to be our patron and to grant us victory over the disbelieving people. Are you with us, Muslims? Are you with us, black men and women of America? Will we drive the enemies into the hells? All right. Happy Savior's Day. Salam Alaikum. Give her another warm round of applause. Sister Tainetta Muhammad. Moving right along, because we want to get to the main course of this program to hear the words of our leader and our teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Brothers and sisters, Muslims in particular, when you say that you believe in God, when you say you believe in Allah, remember we have a duty, and our duty is as servants and also as saviors in the world. We must be activists and revolutionary in our movement until corruption is rid from the earth. That's our job. Otherwise, you're not Muslims. Muslim is one who submits his will to do the will of Almighty God, Allah. And it is Allah's will to rid the earth of all corruption, rid the earth of Satan from inside of the hearts and the minds of our people. With that, let us bring on our nation of Islam, one of our national attorneys and minister, regional minister of the Mid-Atlantic region here in the United States of America, headquartered in mosque number four in Washington, D.C. Let's bring him on with a warm, happy Savior's Day round of applause, Minister Abdul Arif Muhammad. In the name of Allah the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, we forever thank him for his coming and raising in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide, the exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we can never thank them enough for our divine reminder and comfort of the day, who is making out of us a great and mighty nation, the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And in their names, we offer to you the greeting words of peace of Assalamu alaikum. Happy Savior's Day. 
I want to thank the Honorable Louis Farrakhan for this opportunity. I was asked to come up and to talk to you about something you've been hearing. If you can see a lapel, that button that I'm wearing that says, I'm one in a million. We know what that's referring to, the Million Man March in October of 1995. The enemy is already doing all he can do to stop us. For he understands the significance of this march. This is not like the marches of the past. Many of the marches of the past had a good purpose, but the enemy got in and redirected us from our goal. But under the leadership of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, in conjunction with the wise council of organizations today, who see what happened years ago in unity with us, we're going to march on Washington in October of 1995 like never before and let America know that the black man time has come. Spiritually, we are witnessing God gathering together his people. Don't be fooled by what they say. God's hand now has moved across the face of the waters. And you have a man in the Honorable Louis Farrakhan who's loved in every sector and every section of America in our communities. He's a man loved in the church. He's a man loved by the nationalist community. He's a man loved by every organization who sees him as a man of integrity, a man of sincerity, a man who loves God and wants to bring together the unity of black people as never before. And your presence here today signifies that. So give yourselves again a warm round of applause. So it's time now to register. We want you to know that today, black man, you don't have to wait until tomorrow. You can register today for the Million Man March. And we are asking for a small donation of $10 because we have to defray the cost of the march. But we want to let you know what you will get beautiful commemorative packages for your donation of $10. What you will get is a beautiful tape, cassette tape, of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan that addresses excerpts of why the Million Man March must come into reality. You will get this beautiful button that says I am one in a million that you can wear on your lapel. You can get a bumper sticker that says I am one in a million and you'll get a beautiful color brochure that tells you all about the Million Man March and why. Isn't this a lovely package? It's so lovely, isn't it? For those who may not be able to register here today and for those who are listening at this telecast, all you need to do is check at any local Muhammad Mosque in your city or your state, and it will give you the necessary information about the registration process. So brothers and sisters, in October 16th is actually the date that has been set. October 16th, 1995. And so we're saying, not just to the men, but to the women in the audience, even though we're going to be doing the marching, we know that, as always, you have backed us in everything that we've had to do. And so, and so, as always, we say to the black women in the audience, you're not going to just be sitting down, are you? Let me hear it from the black woman. You're not going to just be sitting down, are you? You have to help us plan the march. But we will be the infantry, we'll be the vanguard, we'll be on the front line to fight for you, our families, our women, our girls, and our nation. It's time for the black man to rise. And the enemy is afraid of our unity. Why do you think he tried to break up the African American Leadership Summit? Why do you think they try to paint our leader in a certain way that he can't get next to us and give the light of truth and the light of God to us? Our unity is more powerful than a nuclear bomb. And this enemy knows that when we unite, he'll never make us slaves again, and he'll never be able to rule us as he did before. And the time is now for us to rise. So I say to you in conclusion, God's hand is upon us all, and he's moving across the face of the waters. 
and we are that great water. So I simply say to us on behalf of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, let us from this day forward get busy. Let us register, register, register. The enemy is already trying to take polls saying that there's not a great support for this march. Well, we will show you how much support that it is from the march, and we want you to let the enemy know right now how strongly you support the march. Let every black man who stands for this cause stand up now in the audience. Every black man, let them see that the black man is ready to stand for his own. I thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Praise is due to Allah. This indeed is a Savior's day. You know, before we bring on the next speaker, I want a very warm round of applause to all of those hard working laborers. And now I'm not just speaking of officials, but all these Muslims throughout America who work very diligently and hard to make the nation of Islam what it is today and what it promises to be tomorrow. Give them a warm round of applause. You look beautiful, brothers and sisters. All praise is due to Allah. I don't know why, but I'm reminded of words of a revolutionary soldier at the beginning of this century coming out of Mexico, the southern part of Mexico, and I know that Mexico and Central America and Spanish-speaking people in the continent of Africa are listening and viewing us right now. And those words come from the revolutionary by the name of Emiliano Zapata, who said, La tierra pertenece a quienes trabajen la tierra, which means the land belongs to those who work the land. We are a talented nation of people. We are 4 billion, 400 million plus original people around the globe. This is not a time for us to ask, what should we do? This is a time that we should get up and do something for the salvation of our people. <laughs> Moving right along, we've got some more fire for you. And this fire is coming out of one of our brothers and fellow ministers, who is the Southern Regional Minister, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, Muhammad's Mosque, number 15. Look at you, you know who I'm talking about. And of course, you know about the farm we have down in Atlanta, Georgia. More information in just a moment. That was a appetizer. I'm talking about that powerful, young, fiery minister who loves in a powerful love of God, Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, whose birth date we celebrate today, who loves the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who loves the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, whose 40th anniversary in the Nation of Islam we celebrate today. I speak of, and you receive him with a strong welcome. Our minister and brother, Abdul Jamil Muhammad, bring him on. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Happy Savior's Day. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom all praise is due forever. I thank Allah for his coming, and I thank Allah for raising up in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide for us, the Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I thank Allah and Messenger Elijah Muhammad for bestowing upon us 
out of their mercy and undeserved kindness and grace to us. I speak of our leader and teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names, I greet you on this Savior's Day, 1995, with the greetings of peace and paradise. Once again, we say, Assalamu alaikum. How y'all feel today? I'm glad you feel fine on Savior's Day. Give yourself a hand. You're in the right place at the right time with the right folk next to you. And then while you, while you got your hands together, give the person next to you a round of applause because they did a fine thing coming to be here today too. We've been joined by our First Lady, the wife of our leader and teacher, Minister Farrakhan's beloved wife of over 40 years, the First Lady of the Nation of Islam, the Queen of the Muslims in the wilderness of North America. Here she is, Sister Khadija Farrakhan. We welcome her. Take a bow on the other side. You gotta take a bow on the other side. On this side, let's take a bow over here too. Do y'all love her on this side too? brothers and sisters. That's the wife of our leader and teacher, and she, he has said, is one of the wind beneath his wings. Oh, it's Savior's Day, brother and sister. Savior's Day, 1995. Brothers and sisters, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the Assistant Minister of Mosque Mariam here in Chicago, Illinois, our headquarters of the Nation of Islam, and he is also the Central Midwestern Regional Minister. My brother, son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Minister Ishmael Rahman Muhammad. Will you please bring him on? Love you, boy. Love you too. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of all the worlds, the revealer of all truth, the sender of all prophets. We thank him for Moses, we thank him for Jesus, we thank him for Muhammad. We thank Allah for all of his prophets and messengers and servants to humanity that they might be redeemed and restored and brought back on the straight path of correctness and righteousness. But as a black man in America, I cannot thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and raising up for us a divine leader, a divine teacher, and a divine guide in the personage of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But now we have to give thanks to yet another one, because someone has made us to know who the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was, is, and will be for black America and black people all over the world. You know who I'm talking about. That bold, courageous leader, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace of Assalam Alaikum. And maybe you thought that was a long salutation. I have, brothers and sisters, the distinct honor and privilege of presenting to you, introducing to you, and giving way to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I am in no way qualified to introduce this man, and I am not qualified to really present him to you, for I think God has already done that through his work and through his message. But I would like, as we introduce and prepare to hear from him, for us to look at the value of such a leader today 
that we will not repeat the mistakes of yesterday, that we might heed to the word and heed to that which Farrakhan is calling us to, that we might be saved as a people. In the 400th year of our sojourn in America, God led a man to the voice of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It is written in your Bible of the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, prepare ye the way, make straight in the desert a highway for the Lord. Minister Louis Farrakhan, at 21 years of age, answered the call of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to come to his aid to help to resurrect the black man and woman of America. And he became a registered Muslim of the Nation of Islam in Boston, Massachusetts. His love for his people and his desire to see them free propelled him to the ranks of leadership in the Nation of Islam. From lieutenant to captain to assistant minister to minister of Muhammad's temple number 11 in Boston. After the death of Malcolm X, Minister Farrakhan became the minister of Muhammad's temple number seven in New York City and the national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. His unique ability to articulate the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad drew many to the ranks of Islam. And it is written, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Minister Louis Farrakhan, without question, lifted his father, his teacher and leader's name more than any other minister in the nation of Islam. After the apparently sudden departure of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1975, 20 years ago this day, expected by a few and unexpected by the masses. There came confusion, division, hopelessness, and a falling away. For three years, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's name was mocked, ridiculed, and maligned. His work was dismantled, and the enemies of the Nation of Islam, which are the enemies of black people, did not want to see the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's name and work remembered and carried on for they knew the value as they know today, the value of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. During this period, Minister Farrakhan was to remain silent and he was deeply grieved over the death of the nation of Islam. In 1977, Minister Louis Farrakhan decided to stand up and lift his leader and teacher's name and work and back work to build the nation back up again for the redemption of his suffering people. Many said it was impractical. Many said it was improbable. Many said it was absolutely impossible. Why? Because no other organization had ever, listen good, no organization has ever, re after its destruction, been able to regain its former glory. He's not an ordinary man. He's an extraordinary man. Minister Farrakhan would begin in 1978 to speak in various cities and universities across 
this United States traveling by car into small towns throughout the South, traveling to the North, traveling to the South, to the East and to the West, spreading the word and dropping the vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad back into the minds of our people. He went on to establish study groups. We call them little cells in the various cities across America. One study group didn't know that just down the block was another one. Different cells were being established and no one knew each other until he brought everybody together to celebrate our first Savior's Day in 1981. In 1978, Minister Farrakhan published the first edition of the Final Call newspaper. It was entitled, The Ultimate Challenge, The Survival of the Black Nation. Of course, through your efforts, the believers, supporters, and sympathizers of the Nation of Islam, we have built a multi-million dollar, magnificent, fabulous salam restaurant and bakery complex on 79th near Halstead. We have been blessed to purchase tractor trailer trucks that will be taking our products with the Final Call newspaper and other products to the various cities and outlets throughout the nation. We have purchased three and we plan on purchasing 10 this year, but the goal is to have a fleet of 100 tractor trailer trucks for the nation of Islam. It's very important, Islam. We have retrieved the property of the National Center, Mosque Maryam, which is the national headquarters for the nation of Islam, the University of Islam to educate our children, and with your efforts and contributions to the three-year economic program. He said that the first line of business would be what? Agribusiness. And we can't be a free people and be independent unless we have some of this earth that we can call our own. So Farrakhan took your nickels and your dimes and your dollars and we went back to the farmland that was owned by the nation of Islam in the state of Georgia. And we went and purchased 1,600 acres of farmland. And all praise is due to Allah. And we plan on purchasing 10,000 more acres by year's end. And the goal is 1 million acres of farmland so that we might feed our people. This is just some of the few things that Minister Louis Farrakhan is leading us to. He's a wonderful leader and God has blessed him to work his will by restoring, rebuilding, and resurrecting a fallen people. He has worked the vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as a true son of that great man. You and I are alive today, conscious today, as a result of the work of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Can you deny that, Black America? Let me show you what you have said. Just in the last year, 1994, Time Magazine conducted a poll. And they asked those that were polled, how many believe that Farrakhan is teaching and telling the truth? 62% said Farrakhan is telling the truth. 63% said that Farrakhan is an effective leader. When black people were polled in Detroit, 85% said he was the best qualified leader to lead our people towards their freedom and their justice. All over the country, 
There is no question and no doubt he has emerged as the premier leader of black America. Are you ready to receive that son of the honorable Elijah Muhammad, our leader, our teacher, our big brother, the honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan? Let's hear it for Minister Farrakhan. Too. Very much, very much. In the name of Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever, the great Mahdi. And in the name of his servant, our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, his Messiah to us, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear and wonderful brothers and sisters who are here at the International Amphitheater in Chicago and those who are watching by satellite in the various cities of America and the various colleges and universities and those who are watching by satellite throughout the world. I am so happy to greet all of you with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Well, so much has already been said. I think it's time for us to just get busy. <laughs> Certainly, I would like to give thanks to all of the laborers of Islam our great uh, assistant minister, Minister Ishmael Muhammad, the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes. Sister Tainetta Muhammad, the wife of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, for her words. The national uh, spokesman, uh, Dr. and Brother Minister Abdul Alim Muhammad, our Minister of Health, for his words. And to all of you, uh, dear brothers and sisters, for this great outpouring of love that I have felt over this past week. Yes, sir. To the leaders who are present here today, to the teachers and preachers, to the various organizational heads, I am very, very honored by your presence. 
Today is the 40th anniversary of my being given to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad by Allah as a Savior's Day gift to him. To help him in his great mission of giving life to 40 or more million of our people in the United States and hundreds of millions of our people and others throughout the world. 40 years ago, on this very day, and at approximately this very time, I was a young musician playing in downtown Chicago at Gene Fadouli's Blue Angel nightclub on Rush Street. I was the featured performer in a show called Calypso Follies. I was known then as the charmer because the songs that I sang and the spirit in which I sang them were considered charming to those who heard my songs and felt my personality and therefore the name Chama stuck. However, as I entered Muhammad's Mosque Number no. 2, which was then at 5335 South Greenwood Avenue on February the 26th, I wondered what I would see and what I would hear. I was fascinated by the search procedure and somewhat frightened that they separated my wife and my first child from me. And of course, my wife is seated here with me today and my first daughter, Bessie Jean, who went with me to the mosque that time. And while my wife was seated on the main floor, I was in the balcony where I had a direct view of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I later learned that he had me seated in that particular place so that he and also others could have a direct view of me and how I was responding to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Well, being a student of English and having studied Latin for many, many years in grammar school and high school, I was somewhat taken aback by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's splitting of verbs and what I termed misuse of the language. But the moment that I thought this concerning his speech, he looked up at me directly and said these words. Brother, I didn't have a chance to get that mighty fine education that you received. When I got to the school, the door was closing. He said, don't you pay no attention to how I'm saying it. You pay attention to what I'm saying. Then you take it and put it in that fine language that you know only try to understand what I'm saying. I was shocked because it appeared that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was reading my thoughts. But little did I know 40 years ago at this very time, on this very day, when he spoke those very words, that he was giving me my assignment and foretelling my future. My wife and I accepted the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad on that day. And from that day to this, I have dedicated my life to the rise of our people under the guidance of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi to whom praise is due forever, and his servant, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our great leader, teacher, and guide. Now, I came to my spiritual father 40 years ago today in the year 1955. In that same year, 1955, our sojourn in America 
as servitude slaves and free slaves was officially ended according to the prophet's predictions. Wherein, in the book of Genesis, God said to Abraham, know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. But after that time, God speaking, he said, I will come, and I will judge that nation which they shall serve. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance and go to their fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age. Now, according to history, as written by the scholars, they said, we came to America or were brought to America in the year 1619, one year before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock in 1620. However, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad pointed out to us that there were 64 hidden years of our history a history that was so terrible, so wicked, so diabolical in its practice that we were transformed from a people of tremendous quality, skill, wisdom, and righteous bearing into a people that could be typed as subhuman. The scriptures of the Bible teach that this people in the book of Daniel would be stripped of their own names and language and taught the language of the Chaldeans. The scriptures also teach that this people would be compared to the gold and silver vessels of God, corrupted with wine and strong drink. And here we are. In answer to these great prophecies, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us that the true origin and time of our enslavement in the Western Hemisphere began with an English slave trader by the name of John Hawkins. Some people refer to him as John Hopkins. His father was a great seaman who prepared the way for his son to deceive us and bring us out of our native land and people in the year 1555 on a ship called Jesus. From 1555 to 1955 is 400 years. Now here we are in 1995, 440 years from the time that our fathers first landed on the shores of Jamestown, Virginia. Now this 440 is a very significant number. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that our fathers wandered down to the shores saying, you can have this world, just give me Jesus. Give me that ship, Jesus that would take me back to my native land and people. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, little did we know that it would be 400 years before the real ship Jesus, God in person, would come and deliver us from this oppression and from this oppression and from the ignorance that this oppression had put us under. The real ship Jesus, he said, is God himself, who would come after that sheep that was lost. And so today, I have chosen for my subject. Yes, the Million Man March. Yes, who will save the black man. But the real subject is Jesus saves. Now, 
The Honorable Elijah Muhammad worked among us for 40 years. It is historic as well as ironic that we are here celebrating Savior's Day 20 years after we were in this very place. We have not been here to deliver a Savior's Day message in 20 years. 20 years ago, this very day, at this very hour, the poor followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad accepted the news that was given that Elijah Muhammad, our leader, teacher, and guide, was dead. 20 years ago, on this very stage, the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad hoisted on their shoulders the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, now known as Imam Warith Dean Muhammad, as the successor to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. However, within three years, everything that we, the poor followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, had sacrificed to build was gone. Twenty years later, in 1995, we stand in this very place to say to the world that God has blessed us to restore his name, to restore his word, to restore his people, and to restore our souls. As it is written, Elijah must first come. Why must Elijah first come? Because Elijah is the trumpet that lets you know that the Messiah is on his way. Elijah must first come and restore all things. I am in that spirit of Elijah to restore unto you the things that have been taken from you in this last 20 years. When the old followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, many of whom are sitting here today, saw everything that they sacrificed to build appear to go down the drain, their hearts were broken. And while some of us might want to point the finger of blame to Imam Warithuddin Muhammad or to others or to me or to others, the truth of the matter is written in the scriptures. Jesus in the scripture takes the responsibility for he said in these words, If I destroy the temple, I will rebuild it in three days. What do you mean, pastors? Jesus himself is the destroyer. Jesus himself is the builder. For if except the Lord build the house, we build in vain. So if one was chosen to destroy it, he's an agent of the Jesus. And if another was chosen to rebuild it, he's the agent of the Jesus. I'm just so happy I was chosen to rebuild it and not to destroy it. So today, we want to know who is this Jesus who can save. 440 years. What is the meaning of such a number? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad worked 40 years absent from his teacher or away from his teacher, Master Farad Muhammad. And 
it took another four years in preparation for the work that he would do in the absence of his teacher so we have 44 years of the honorable elijah muhammad's presence among us then he departs now we're at 440 years of our sojourn in music <laughs> the concert a that every instrument tunes up by in the orchestra is 440 vibrations per second so if we say that 440 vibrations equals a and a is the first letter of the alphabet so a equals one and one is the first number of the language of mathematics mm -hmm. then what are we to learn today from this 440 years from this a the concert a that everybody has got to tune up by what are we to learn from that concert a that is number one the first note or the first number of the language of mathematics here's what we are to learn we have now come after 440 years to the beginning of the establishment of the kingdom of god it is not that we are to preach the kingdom we now have the power to establish that kingdom on earth if we will rise up and take that responsibility everyone must tune up their minds now i know there are all kind of thinking in here today but i'm gonna sound the concert a and I want you to begin to tune your minds up to what I'm about to say. Because what I'm about to say will give you more power than you have ever had in your life to make a change in your life and to start from this day forward, not to talk about the kingdom, but to begin to build the kingdom of God on earth. All praise is due to Allah. A represents Allah. One represents Allah. You know what this means, Muslims? We have evolved into that number one, which means that we, the Muslims, can now demonstrate the power of Allah more fully than we have ever demonstrated his power in the history of our sojourn in america what do i mean by that the honorable elijah muhammad taught us how allah created himself and he had to build himself up into the darkness and ten thousand parts made the one Jesus comes at the end of the world at the head of 10,000. I'm saying to you, Muslims, look at yourself today. We cannot even fit in here. The 10,000 is here, and the one is also here with the 10,000. It's time to get up and go to work and build the kingdom of God. Now, if we don't tune up, listen, listen, listen. If we don't tune up our actions, tune up our thoughts, 
tune up our program on the basis of God, then everything that we plan and everything that we are attempting will fail. Except the Lord build the house, we build in vain. Who is the Lord that is to build the house? And who are the builders that will build according to the will of the Lord who wants to build his kingdom in the midst of the decayed kingdoms of this world? This is why we have called this Savior's Day. God day with the Lord is as a thousand years. We're not just celebrating the birth of a great man on this day, but the man's birth whom we celebrate brings in with his birth the millennium, a thousand years in which the old world and all its ways will be done away with, swept out, and the new will be established. The wicked are going to be uprooted, and the righteous will be firmly planted, and the way and the will of God will prevail over all ideas, thoughts, and opinions in the world. Savior's Day. Jesus saves. On every church, just about, throughout America, we see this sign, Jesus saves. But the people in the church under that sign are dying from ignorance and corruption, filth and degeneracy. But everywhere we look, the talk is Jesus saves. I want to ask my Christian brothers and sisters, do you think, listen good, that by mentioning Jesus' name alone, that this is going to save you? I know the scripture says, there is no name under the heavens whereby a man can be saved but by the name of Jesus. Well, the name of Jesus is on the lips of millions of people who know not how to save themselves. Nor are they aware of the plan that has already been worked out for their salvation. Don't get shook up. Just listen. Now listen. Calm down. <laughs> the true name of a thing is the nature and the function of that thing. So if the name of Jesus is the name that allows salvation to come, then this saving power is not the recitation of the name alone. But the saving power is being in harmony with the nature, the function, the principle, and the program of the man under that name. This actually is the power, is the work, or the function that saves. Unless we come under his name, meaning accept his nature, his function, his will, his way, his principles, and his program. There is no salvation for any of us. Well, what you mean, Farrakhan, except the nature of Jesus Christ? The thing that sets Jesus apart and makes him stand above all the prophets is the perfect obedience in Jesus to the will of God. Therefore, Jesus could say, I and my Father are one. His obedience 
It's from the nature of him. And unless you don't say, I accept Jesus, a picture by Michelangelo of his concept of a pale-faced, blue-eyed, Caucasian Jesus, it's not accepting a pale picture or a black picture, a dreadlock picture, or a curly head picture, or a blonde or brunette picture. It's acceptance of the nature of Jesus to bow down completely to the will of God. And that's why Jesus said, many of you will say, Lord, Lord. Yes, and he will say what? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. Okay, let's move on. Jesus represents a body of knowledge. That he asks his disciples to discipline their lives by. In our willingness to discipline every aspect of our lives to the word and the example of the Jesus, to that degree, we have salvation. Man. That makes it kind of difficult, doesn't it? There's a lot of us in church, you know what I mean? Playing church. A lot of us in the mosque. <laughs> playing mosque. A lot of us in the synagogue. Playing synagogue. All in the name of righteous men. Jesus, Moses, Muhammad. Let's stop this foolishness unless we are willing to discipline our lives to every aspect of that body of knowledge brought by the prophet to that degree and that degree alone we have salvation now there's a scripture in the Bible that indicates that each of us has the responsibility to work out our own salvation well if we can work it out, why is there a need for a savior? We got a song. He will work it out. No, he ain't gonna work it out. He has worked it out. The question is, are you willing to work it out with him? according to the plan that he's laid out to help us work it out. The Savior comes to give us the means, the method, or the way by which we can be saved. So a man stands up and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's telling you, watch the way I walk. Watch the way I live my life. Watch the word I speak. Go ahead, go ahead. And then take me as the way. Follow me. Don't talk about me. Follow me. Jesus haven't told none of you to worship him. He said, follow him. And that's your problem. You say you're worshiping him, but ain't hardly too many of you following Jesus. Now, to the degree that we refuse to work out our salvation by disciplining our lives to the teachings that we accept, we forbid the Savior to step in to save and redeem us. But what is the meaning of salvation? What do you mean, save? Do you who are listening here and who are listening by satellite, wouldn't you want to be saved? 
if you were in a burning building and you saw fire all around you, wouldn't you welcome somebody who offered you a way out of the building? I think you would. If you were drowning, somebody threw you a lifeline, what you gonna say? You the wrong color, I ain't accepting it? See, when it comes to saving your life, you ain't worried about color. Anti-Semite is not gonna tell a Jewish person, you can't save me. <laughs> the anti-black person is not gonna say, oh, you, you too black, you can't save me. Once you see your life is threatened, you don't care what the color is, what the race is, what the sex is, for God's sake, get me out of here. <laughs> the sad thing about this world is that the world is in that condition. It's under a crushing weight of its own evil but the world is so proud and arrogant that it refuses to cry out, save me. The leaders are arrogant. They don't know what they're doing. Excuse me, leaders, not you. I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you, black leaders, no. I'm talking to the high people in power. They don't know what they're doing. But they're too arrogant to say, oh man, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. But the poor, the weak, the dispossessed, those of us who live in the ghettos of America and the ghettos of the world, we know that we're in a terrible condition. Our communities are in total disrepair. We know that we are in need of salvation. The question is, who will save us? And by what means shall we be saved? And this is why I've chosen this subject, not just who will save the black man and why, or the million man march, but Jesus saves. But I want to bring you face to face with the Jesus who saves. If it is Jesus who saves, this is not a spirit, this is not a spook. This is a real live human being. But a human being with the wisdom of the time and the knowledge of what must be done in order to bring about salvation. Are we referring to the Jesus who prefigured the Jesus of today? Are we talking about the historical Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago, or are we referring to the one that he referred to? Did you know? Y'all all right? Did you know that the Jesus of 2,000 years ago let himself out of this work? How can a man be saved except by a superior knowledge of truth in a world of falsehood and deceit? If the Jesus 2,000 years ago said these words, there are many things that I could tell you, but you cannot bear it now, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he, not me, Jesus said, not me, he will guide you into all truth. Well, if the people of that time with that man could not bear the truth, meaning they didn't have the foundation to carry the weight of the knowledge that it would take to save themselves. You gotta have a foundation for that kind of knowledge. 
And if you don't have a foundation for that knowledge, God would be unjust to reveal that kind of knowledge to you. Listen. The truth that Jesus was re referring to that would free human beings was too much for the people of that time. They didn't have the foundation to bear that kind of knowledge. Plus, the world had to grow and experience so much more of the wickedness of Satan and the wickedness of self. All Satan's wickedness had to be manifest and all our wickedness had to be so great that we were drowning in our own filth. Wickedness had to reach its zenith, which it had not done during the time of Jesus of 2,000 years ago. So he let himself out of this. When he has come, the spirit of truth, he, not I, will guide you into all truth. This means that the one Jesus saw coming in his name would fulfill the function that he prefigured the nature the will and the way fully developed would be in a future man who would come at the end of the world of the wicked what would he look like how you gonna tell me you looking for somebody you never seen before and don't have an accurate description of the man The scripture describes it. He's not Caucasian. No offense, no offense. No racism. The way the book describes him, he's definitely not Caucasian. The way the book describes him, he's not Asian as we know Asians. He's a man of dark color. He's a man of woolly hair. According to the book, he's a black man. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I know some of us just lost salvation just like that. We don't want it. If he's black, he can't save me. Black man can't do nothing for me, but show me which way the white man went. Some of us, some of us unfortunately think just like that. Some of us who are black can't stand to think, the thought even, that a black man would have the ability the power, the will, and the program to save us. And there are some white people who have just tuned out right away. They just turned off the television. Oh, Lord. You mean a nigger's going to save us? <laughs> well, if you think like that, you just messed up. See, with us, we don't care if Jesus is a Caucasian. If he were Caucasian, I wouldn't have a problem following him. I just wouldn't have that problem. I don't think you would either, would you? Not if you're a bigger person than I think, that I think you are. You are able to look beyond color. You've been following white your life. So you wouldn't have no problem following Jesus if he was white. I, some of you done got so black in recent years. <laughs> But you still go downtown and buck dance, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. A whole bunch of buck dancing brothers and sisters 
in the name of blackness. I am a black buck dancer. No, I would not have a problem following her if the Jesus were female. I wouldn't have a problem. See, my mother was a woman. I guess yours was too. And my mom taught me very well so if Jesus came as a woman, I would be able to look past biology because I'm not following biology, I'm not following race, I'm not following ethnicity. The program, the will, the principle, the truth. This is what we got to look for today. No matter who carries it, white people, if a black man carries it and it's your salvation, accept the truth and live. However, since the world has crushed the black man and he is the most crushed of all the people of color on the earth, then it seems to me that when you are looking for a Jesus who will deliver, save, reform, reconcile, and redeem, you would not think to look for this one coming from a people who have been rejected and despised. Nevertheless, the scripture says he would come to and from a people despised and rejected. He would be a stone that all the builders rejected, yet he would be the headstone of the corner. This is not just a, a man, an ordinary man. This is an extraordinary human being, a human being that is a bridge between man and God. Oh, let me talk about Jesus. He's a human being, listen good, that is a bridge between man and God. He's a human being who breaks down the wall or partition that has separated man from God. He's a human being that allows men and women to access God in a way that previously in this world no prophet could do. What kind of access are we referring to? This Jesus is a bridge that allows us to access the mind of God, the spirit of God, to become his own children, that we may grow up to be and exercise power like our Father. This kind of access was not given to or through any prophet, but is given through this one who comes at the end of the world, who is called Messiah, who is called Jesus, the Christ. Go ahead. This one who comes is to raise men and women from the fall and consequence of the fall of Adam. Therefore, he is to raise human beings from a dead level and bring them back to the living perpendicular or upright living according to the will and way of God. This then is restoring man and woman to our godly powers. Godly powers. Oh, brothers and sisters, you have the potential for so much power, but you are not 
functioning at a fraction of the level of power that each one of you are capable of attaining. Well, how does Satan accept this? A human being coming to be a bridge to help us to access God in a way that no prophet has ever been able to do. Well, Satan is the natural enemy of God. Satan knew that God was coming. Satan knew that this extraordinary human being would be in the world at a particular time. Therefore, Satan went to work to prepare the people to receive him. You mean Satan went to work to prepare the people to receive Jesus? Sure. That's the question. My brother said, but what kind of reception? not to receive Jesus with the honor and submission that he was due, but to receive him in a way of rejecting him, cursing him, maligning him, speaking evil of him that the scriptures might be fulfilled, that you and I would be made so ignorant by Satan that we would take darkness for light and light for darkness, truth for falsehood and falsehood for truth, heaven for hell and hell for heaven, we would be turned totally upside down so that the scriptures again might be fulfilled. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. And the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. How's he going to come? Where's he coming from? If he's a man, he's coming from some place to another place. How is he coming? What will mark his coming? How will you know he's present? What sign will we see of his presence that we who have been destroyed under the fall of Adam and the deceit of Satan may find the way to our salvation? In the book of Habakkuk, in the Old Testament, in the third chapter, the scripture says, God came from T-man. Let's stop right there. T-Man was one of the sons of Adak. Go ahead, minister. So if God came from one of the sons of Adak, he's a man coming from a man. Yes. Therefore, he gets the name in the scripture, son okay. of man. Yes. Let's talk about it. Yes. Then it says, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. The Holy One came from Mount Paran and God came from T-Man then God and the Holy One are two different men, but two different men coming from two different places for two different works at two different times. Listen. T-Man is a, also a city in Arabia. The God of this world came from Arabia. The God of the future world came from Mount Paran. He's known as a holy one. And the earth was filled with his praise. The name Muhammad means one worthy of praise and one praise much. The scholars of the world admit that the most significant man in the history of the world is a man named Muhammad from Arabia. He is more significant than Galileo in the hundred most influential men of the last 6,000 years. He's more influential than Newton. 
according to these scholars, he's more influential than Jesus or Paul. Muhammad was the most successful of any prophet on the earth, and the earth is filled with his praise. As a sign of a Muhammad that would come at the end of the world. Listen to me good now. Muhammad the prophet, peace be upon him, filled the earth with Islam. His companions did that. But the Islamic world today has lost the path. The Islamic world today is corrupted and in need of a reformer. Talk to me. Then who will reform the world of Islam if Muhammad is the last prophet and the seal of the prophet and the world of Islam has gone to hell? Then you tell me why must a reformer come if Muhammad is the last one? Talk back to me. You all say Jesus of 2,000 years ago did the work. Well, why are you in the condition you're in? If you know Jesus, why aren't you doing his work in the power of that man? You are a liar. You don't know that man. you to listen to me this afternoon. Jesus was not about building a church. You and I can't go back to the Father and say, look at the big church I built. And you're not building people. It's easy to put a brick on top of a brick and slap some mortar in it and say you got a church. It don't take but so much skill to do that. But to take a human being and transform their lives and put one human being together with another one and mortar in between them with the love of God and the love of the brotherhood so that you build up a spiritual house so that the Spirit of God can live in the true house of God. Muhammad and Jesus were a sign of one who would come at the end of the world. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. But there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went at his feet. He stood and he measured the earth. He beheld and he drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. And I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. All of this has meaning. He had power in his hands. His presence was as the light. You can't be in the presence of God or the Messiah and be in darkness. For he is the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
Listen. He had horns coming out of his hand. Horns represent power. He had power, but he hid his power. Fulfilling the scripture that he would make himself of no reputation. He had power, but he didn't declare his power, not at that time. Before him went the pestilence, plagues announcing his coming. Just like the Bible said, there would be wars and rumors of wars. There would be earthquakes in diverse places. There would be pestilence and famine. But these would be just the beginning of sorrows. This is the announcement that somebody's present. Look at the world's condition. Wars and rumors of wars. Nation rising against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Is that right? But look, he stood and he measured the earth. The earth is 24,896 miles in circumference. It has a diameter of 7,926 miles. The water of the earth is 139,685,000 square miles. And the land coming up out of water is 57,255,000 square miles. He gave us the knowledge of the rivers and the seas and the lakes and the mountains. Why? How do you know this? Because he stood and he measured the earth. And burning coals went at his feet, meaning everywhere he went, revolution broke out. Everywhere he went, revolution broke out. Why revolution? Because Satan has been sitting over the masses of people, white and black, Jew and Gentile. But when that man begins to walk, revolution would go. The tents of Cushan in affliction. Kush is you. The tents of Cushan in affliction. Kush is you. Are you in affliction? Everywhere the black man is on earth, he's under affliction. But the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Curtains, meaning that which blocks out light. Now the people who block the light from coming, they're trembling now because Jesus, Jesus saves and he's present in the world. Can y'all be patient with me? Because the subject is so deep. By the grace of God. It's my 40th year. I gotta preach today. If I never preach again in my life, I gotta tell it today. <laughs> Matthew, in the book of Matthew, the scripture says how he comes from the east unto the west. As lightning shines from the east even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What's happening in the West? That it demands the presence of God in person. In the West, the eagles have gathered together. 
plucking and eating the flesh of a carcass. Why did he say, where the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together? Listen, George, listen, listen. What are you trying to do, Farrakhan? I'm trying to get the eagles off the carcass. And I'm trying to put life in the carcass in the West. You the carcass, black man. And the symbol of America is an eagle. And the eagles have picked your flesh clean. And you are more in need of salvation than any people on the earth. Ezekiel used that terminology, the son of man. But Ezekiel saw the son of man being set down in a valley that was full of bones. Dry bones in the valley. But he had to come as a thief in the night. What night? Most thieves come in the night. But we got some bold thieves today. They rob you day or night. <laughs> Say in the hood, we know those kind of thieves. They'll rob you while you're looking. Get out that car. There was a th time when thieves waited for night to fall. That's the time when thieves had a look cold. Well, he came like a thief in the night. What does the night mean? At a time when the wicked who ruled were not paying attention to the predictions of the prophets. They had gone to sleep on their watch. And at that time, he comes as a thief in the night to seek and to save that which was lost. Brothers and sisters, is the black man lost? Talk to me. Are we lost? Well, what do we mean lost? According to Roger's thesaurus, when a person is lost, they're unable to find their way. Go ahead. When they're lost, they're irredeemable, irreformable, irreconcilable, hopelessly wicked, beyond repair, lost. They're no longer in the possession, care, or control of someone or something. No longer known or practiced, unable to function, act, or make progress. Are we lost? Yes, Spiritually or physically destroyed. To be unsuccessful in retaining possession of. Everything you get, somebody takes it away. Why? You lost. To fail to win. How many times we gonna run for mayor and not win? Let me depart here for one minute from my text. Before anybody takes up that kind of challenge, you ought to not just look at the numbers, but you ought to look at your ability to excite the numbers. Hell, don't run out there for show. Because every time you run out and lose, you kill the spirit of the people to try again. <laughs> Mayor Sawyer ran and lost. What's the other brother's name? Evans, Tim Evans ran and lost. Judge Pinchum ran twice and lost. I'm not saying we don't have a chance to win, but 
but you got to excite black people. You got to stir black people up. You'll never stir black people up if you're afraid. You'll never stir black people up if your leaders are bought off. You got to make your leaders afraid to sell you out. You have to be able to create so much momentum that anybody that gets in the way of that train will be steamrolled over. And until you have that one that can do that, then damn it, stand back and cultivate the field till you're ready. time for personality foolishness our people are dying we can't play games with them our people are dying is the white man lost I asked a question White people in the audience, you can answer. <laughs> Is the white man lost? He lost. Is America lost? Yeah, America, you lost. Is the world lost? How did America, the black man, the white man, the world get lost? The scripture says, all we like sheep have gone astray. I'd like to change that. Bring it, Vince. Bring it. No, no, no. We ain't gone astray. All we like sheep have been led astray. <laughs> Who is the shepherd of the sheep that has led them astray? You have a conflict now with this one who comes to free the people and find them and bring them again. He has to fight against the one who misled and deceived the people and wants to keep them in a state of perpetual loss that the God in the last days may, be, may destroy them rather than redeem them. So the act of saving is to save a people against the force of Satan. Teach them. Teach. Teach them. To save the people against the force of Satan's wiles and deception. Yeah, yeah. To save the people against Satan's conspiracy to destroy the plan of God for the salvation of the people. Is America lost? Is the black man lost? Is the world lost? And the answer is yes. yes America is lost. She's lost her way. She's lost her moorings. She's lost her morals. She's lost her principles. Some would argue that America never had any. Wait, <laughs> but to those who say America never had any, we could argue back. She had some, but her morals and her principles didn't refer to moral treatment of the darker people. That's right, that's right. America couldn't come up from nothing to where she is except that she followed certain laws, certain principles, and certain morality. She had a morality that lifted her. And she was lifted by following certain immutable principles. And she's falling now because she has deviated from those principles. 
Since the whole world is lost, then the whole world stands in need of salvation. So the Savior who comes must have the wisdom and the power to execute a plan, not just to save a people, but an entire world of people. If they would desire to be saved. But there has to be an instrument through which this plan of salvation is to be implemented. That instrument is considered a man and a people. He's a man taken from the despised and rejected and fitted out with a special knowledge and program that would allow him first to save a very special, particular, and peculiar people. In the plan of God's salvation, he chooses a foolish people. I know, I know, I know. If I ask white people, are you foolish? They say, not me. I run the world. Yeah, that's what he said. Chinese are not going to admit to being foolish. Japanese are not going to admit to be foolish. What about you? You know you're a fool. Like Forrest Gump said, stupid is as stupid does. <laughs> And you know we have done some pretty stupid things, <laughs> foolish things. Come on, come on. <laughs> so God chooses someone or some ones who are at the bottom that he might affect their rise to the top. He chooses an instrument that is considered the least that he in his wisdom and power might make it the most. He chooses someone or some ones who would be the tail that he with his wisdom and power may make it the head. Why would he do this? Because Satan has ruled this world and Satan could never rule by making the true God and his way known. The only way Satan can rule is by obscuring or hiding the knowledge and the reality of the true God. So the true God in coming has to make himself known. So he allows a nation to become powerful and great like he did ancient Egypt. And in that nation, you will find a people weak and insignificant. And he chooses from among the weak and the insignificant in order to make himself known in a world that does not know him. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus saves. In Galatians, I don't go to sleep. I'll take some water and throw it on you. <laughs> don't go to sleep. In Galatians 4 and 4. Now you got that 44 again. Look at what Galatians says. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons master farad muhammad comes he comes oh that man right there let, let me point to him that man right there you don't know nothing about him. But let me tell you a little about him. He comes without observation. The government didn't observe him. Those who are the watchers in the society didn't observe him. He came as a thief in the night. And he came in sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. I'd like to stop here a moment and talk about 
What do we mean by sinful flesh? It could mean that he came in the color or in the absence of color of a people who through sin dominated the darker peoples of the world. I want you to listen to me. There is no intelligent Caucasian person here in the audience or watching by satellite or in the various colleges and universities throughout America who will refuse or deny the fact that Caucasian people, or as they're called, white people, came to power over the darker people, not through righteous means, but through means that are universally considered immoral and even wicked. Come on, come on, don't go to sleep on me now. All right. Now, most white people don't like it when you make generalities. Nobody does. But in truth, the people of that particular color or absence of it are responsible for the destruction of most of, if not all of, the darker people of the world and their way. Whether you came, as you say, in the name of Jesus, that didn't make what you did right. You destroyed people in the name of Jesus. You murdered and pillaged and raped and robbed people in the name of Jesus. You deceived people in the name of Jesus. So, since this is true, coming in sinful flesh could mean he came looking like the people who had captured the people of God. That's why when you say we are racist and we hate people who have white skin, hold it, hold it, hold it. See that man there? We love him. We honor him. We respect him. He looks like a white man, but he's not a white man. So don't tell me we hate him because of his color. Nobody hates white people because of their color. White people are hated in the world because of their evil against themselves and the people of the world. Therefore, coming in that flesh, he would be without observation. Coming in sinful flesh could mean that the flesh in and of itself seeks power to satisfy its craving against the moral nature of the human being. I don't want to lose none of you on anything, but if I happen to lose you or your, your conscience or your, your attention goes somewhere, be sure to get the tape. Because every word that I say today on my 40th anniversary, I am telling you where I'm going in the next few minutes. Lord, I just want you to hang with me. Coming in sinful flesh 
meaning that the power wisdom of God is now clothed in flesh God takes on flesh as a human being Muslims say that's wrong hang with me a minute Muslims he takes on flesh as a human being fighting the same fight that all human beings fight to master the flesh now let's look at this all Muslims are looking for the coming of Mahdi the Mahdi is not an ordinary man the Mahdi is an extraordinary man but he's a human being as a human being the power that the Messiah and the Mahdi operate from is the living power of God so when they function on the living power and reality and word of God and they are in flesh then the flesh is the clothing for the Spirit of God he comes in sinful flesh all this sin comes from us obeying the urges of the flesh mastery of the flesh is the Spirit of God aroused in man to make man a master of his lower nature he comes in the duality of the nature of man man has a nature that is upright and man has a nature that is horizontal like that of animals or beasts of the field you women who don't know how to train your children. You in leadership in government who know how to train lions, tigers, bears, elephants, fleas, but you don't know how to train the human child. God says in the Bible, spare the rod spoil the child it has two meanings Come on. Come on. maybe more but the two I see is that every home has got to function under a rod a rule a law a discipline where there is no rod in a home there is nothing to guide the development of the children in that home. The other rod is that which inflicts pain. I didn't say abuse. I said pain my mother used both rods go ahead, go ahead. she said I don't know anything about psychology I have three ologies that I use slapology stickology and broomology and I think I got the message And it wasn't her mastery of Freud and Jung. It was her mastery of slapology, stickology, and broomology. Jack and I straightened up. Here the government is so crazy. You want to take away the right of a parent to discipline their children. I think if parents abuse the children, we ought to step in but do not deprive a mother and a father of the right to discipline what they brought into this world. That is their responsibility. You have 
to train children in their early development just like you train animals. Because the first stage of human development is called the animalistic stage of development. And you train animals by things that are good and things that give pain. When they do the thing that you approve of, you give them something nice. And when they do the thing that you disapprove of, you touch them with a little pain so that they know, oh, don't go there. Don't go there. But some of you, you love your children so much. Oh, I, I, I can't do that. I, I just can't hit them. I just can't hit them. It's so terrible to hit them. I'm just talking to them. Well, hell, you try talking to an animal. See if that animal understands. Children in the animalistic stage of development do not understand words. Words don't mean pain and pleasure mean. When you got both those rods and you use them with wisdom, your children grow up according to the discipline of your teaching. And after a while, you can remove both rods. But the rod is now established in the child. And the child will only go so far in deviation and then pull back. Because you established the rod well in the heart, in the mind of your child. We come into the world like animals and we grow out of an animalistic stage to a moral stage, then on to a spiritual stage, if we are successful in coming out of the animal stage. Right. Those of us, listen to me, y'all all right? Yeah. Those of us who can do evil, and it doesn't bother us, you're an animal. Right. Right. I'm gonna say that again. You have human potential, but you are in fact an animal. If you can rob and lie and cheat and steal and cut and plunder without any conscience, you're an animal and the Bible calls you a beast or one that has the mark of the beast because you think like a beast, it's in your forehead and it's in your hands in the way you work and in the way you do. In order to come out of an animal stage, we have to be introduced to a body of knowledge that awakens in us a moral consciousness. This is why parents have to watch the children, be an example, and then teach at the right moment those morally correct principles. Once the child develops a moral consciousness, then when you do evil, not that you won't do evil again, but whenever you do evil, it'll wake you up at night. It'll beat you in your head at night. Are you all right? So he comes in that duality, and really that's what is meant by the cross. The cross has an upright part and a horizontal part. See it? You don't worship the cross. You should master the cross. The horizontal nature is the nature in man that makes him act like a beast. The upright part of the cross is the upright nature of the human being that gives him mastery over his lower self. So now when you're on the cross, that actually means you're struggling. That's why Jesus said, can all the world go free? Must Jesus bear the cross alone? No, there's a cross for you. There's a cross for me. And every disciple of Jesus has to pick up whose cross? Whose cross? Your cross. You ain't on no cross. 
You are, sure, because you're constantly struggling to do the right thing. And don't you ever believe that it's not a struggle to do right in a world of wrong. So everyone who struggles to do right is on the cross. In the Quran, it asks the question, have you seen men who take their lower desires or their lower nature as a God beside God? We live in a world where men and women are caught up in the lust for things at the expense of moral correctness. What do you want? You want a car? How will you get it? What do you want? A fur coat? How do you get it? What do you want? A home? How do you get it? Will you whore? Will you pimp? Will you sell drugs? Will you lie? Will you cheat? Will you steal? Will you get the things that you want over and above a moral correctness? See, the difference with Jesus is Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. All right, now, now. Well, we live in a world where the lower nature of man has become his God. And when the lower nature becomes a God beside God, then we don't listen to the conscience of self that constantly warns us against our errant behavior. We crush the conscience if it speaks against the desires of our flesh. And so he comes in that sinful flesh to show us how to overcome as well as master the flesh. And when we master the flesh, we now become master of the grave in which the Spirit of God is buried or is dormant within us. That's what is meant by the resurrection. Resurrection don't mean Somebody dead in the cemetery popping up. Go on out there and try hollering. Get you a trumpet. And blow tonight and tomorrow. Ain't no dead people in there getting up now. Some of you don't like this. But your theology is messed up. I have to tell you that you really do not understand the scriptures. That body that you put down in the earth decomposes and goes back to the earth. That's not what the resurrection is all about. The resurrection is the trumpet of God. Gabriel, Jibril, a man of God, sounding a brassy truth that goes past the ear of opposition and then enters into the heart. And if it finds the heart a repository for itself, then the word quickens within man his true nature, which is the nature of God. Then man begins to rise up in the spirit of God. And the Spirit of God begins to condemn his weakness, his immorality, her weakness and immorality. And when the resurrection is accomplished and man has ascended to God, then he has the power to say to his lower self, I'm in control. I know you want to exercise yourself, but I am in control. I feel lust coming on because that's a mighty fine sister, but I, I am in control. Yeah. 
Na. Oh, Lord. Listen. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, you've been so wonderful. So very wonderful to me in listening. And the greatest thing that you could give me on my 40th anniversary is not money, but your attention. I know you've been here. I know, I know, I know. And I know you've got a lot of things to do and many places to go. But I may not see you again. I said earlier, God would come to and God would come from a particular people. The coming to is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies that God would search the earth for his sheep that were lost. And he would go after that particular one that was lost. He would come to that carcass. He would visit among the dry bones in the valley under the name Son of Man. He would come and be present among them. That's the coming to. But then the coming from means that he would find one from among those to whom he had come. And he would make that one his servant his messenger, his example to those who yet slept in ignorance. And he would pour himself into that one, then go away, leaving himself in the midst of the people in that one. So now he comes to, then he comes from. Now, the scripture said, Jesus was raised from the dead. Who are the dead that he's raised from? It's you. It's me. Just as Moses was drawn out of the water, Jesus is raised from a people who are dead. And it means the knowledge, the wisdom, and the power of God is seen in the last days among a people who were considered no people at all. Why did you come out here today? Now listen to me, listen, listen. What brought you out here? You are scholars, some of you. Scientists, what made you pay $10 for a ticket? Teach us, brother. And wanted to just look at me. What's it? You expected to hear something. This is not happening anywhere in America. Something is going on in America. I'm so happy to say to you, my beloved black brothers and sisters of America, that you have been chosen by the Lord of creation to render a great service, first to yourself and your people, and then to the entire world that is suffering and in need of redemption. You have been chosen not because you're righteous, not because you're black, not because you're good. You have been chosen because of the grace of God. And your unique suffering that was preparation and for a divine purpose to get you ready to receive a high calling, a great mission, and a great assignment from God. What is that mission? First, you have to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What is the house of Israel? Where is this Israel? Who are the Jews? Who is this Israel that the sheep are lost in? America is that Israel. The very 13 stars on the seal of America 
is the star of David. America is Israel. The Israel in the East is a reflection of an Israel that is in the West. And the sheep that are lost in the house of Israel are the black people of America who are lost under the power of America and her people. Come on. Listen, the Bible says Jacob wrestled with an angel. long. Jacob, listen, listen, wrestling with an angel of God. Oh, wait a minute. If you are wrestling with an angel of God, you're in opposition to God. But not only did Jacob wrestle, Jacob prevailed. Wrestling with an angel. Listen, listen. Well, when you contest the angel of God, you are coming with a force and a power opposite the force and power that the angel represents. So if that angel represents God in righteousness, by what power are you contesting him? And if you wrestle with the angel until his thigh is thrown out of place, then you have prevailed through the night, however. You wrestle all night long. It didn't say you prevail in the day because the night was given to you. And because you prevailed, he gives Jacob the name Israel. Jacob was a supplanter. Supplanter means one who is trying to take the place of another. Not necessarily by righteous means. Israel means you prevailed with God. Israel could never have prevailed or Jacob could never have prevailed if God was not with him to prevail. God allowed Jacob to prevail. God allowed Israel to come into existence. Yes. So the sheep of God got lost following the way of the supplanter. Who did they supplant? See, that Israel supplanted God. They wanted you to call him what? Massa. Call me Massa, boy. Who's your master? Only God should be our master. But the white man made us call him what? Massa. And what is a master? A master is one who has mastered a particular thing, a particular field of knowledge, a particular endeavor, or mastered a particular people. And if a wicked man becomes your master, how could you ever become righteous under a wicked master? Well, there's an old saying, we used to sing in the church, God is going to move this wicked race and raise up a nation that will obey. That process of the meeting of Master Farad Muhammad with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that process brought about the formation of that which is called the Nation of Islam. What is the Nation of Islam? The nation of Islam is a group of people committed to obedience to the will of God. Fulfilling what our father said, God will remove the wicked race, raise up a nation that will obey. A nation of obedience, you say it in Arabic, Islam. 
this is a unique nation but how would this nation in this process that is delivering people from the clutches of the power of evil be accepted by the wicked one the supplanter the rulers of this world if you notice when any one of us come to the teachings of the honorable elijah muhammad and accept it the first thing you notice is a change nobody comes to the teaching of elijah muhammad and remains the same you go to church and you join the church but nobody necessarily notices a change but our very appearance changes because our minds have changed our conduct changes because our minds have changed our diet changes because our minds have changed this is not just a change it's a transformation in our lives that is readily noticed by family and friends then you see those of us who accept to become a part of the nation of Islam disciplining ourselves according to a body of knowledge that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad brought and immediately this starts the process of salvation or rescuing us from harm or danger we come to Elijah Muhammad drunkards thieves dope sellers pimps whores murderers cutthroats haters envious people jealous people knowledgeable people with no morals and you see a profound change in our lives family life is restructured marital relations are restructured our homes get saved we were reckless in the way we handle our money but the economic principle that is taught by the Jesus causes you to live within your means and save your home economically and since the God that we represent is not a poor God when we follow him and submit to his teachings he starts lifting us immediately out of poverty and want and that ignorance has placed us in this is all a part of the plan of salvation he inspires us with a new education, new ideas to form a new educational system. He inspires us to work for our own economic deliverance. So the whole plan of Elijah Muhammad is a program that spells salvation for the black man. Well, who should be angry with such a program? Why would the FBI want to destroy a program that is delivering black people? Why would the Anti-Defamation League want to destroy a program that's lifting black people? Why would the government of America work against such a plan that would make a people into something that their fathers destroyed? Make us whole again, make us useful again, and give us a sense of personal value. Why would the government of America fight something like that? Who would fight that? Satan would fight that. Satan would fight it because he doesn't want the people to be saved. There's a song we used to sing in the church. The devil is mad and I'm so glad because he missed the soul that he thought he had. Everyone who comes to Christ or comes to God and sincerely seeks to change, Satan comes after them like a roaring lion. What Satan? Go ahead. Go ahead. Who is Satan? Go ahead. I didn't say what is Satan. We know Satan is a spirit and a force that deceives, but who? Who is Satan? The scripture says that day shall not come 
except there be a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who is the man of sin not a spirit who is the man the man the man of sin The government of America is involved in a conspiracy against the rise of not only our people, but the good that we would ultimately do for their own people and for the world. The government of America is against white people who sincerely work in the best interests of the poor. Listen up. Satan is in a conspiratorial posture towards this Jesus. Satan does not want Jesus to succeed. That's right. Satan does not want to see a true Christian, a truly righteous person, a true Muslim who wants to submit to do the will of God. Satan wants to deceive that person out of the practice of obedience. Dear Muslims, if I never see you again, I want you to hear me because I'm going to put something on your plate today that you can feed on and it will get you through a dark hour. The government is frightened. And when Farrakhan talks about leading a million men to Washington, don't you think the government is happy if a million fleas showed up in Washington they would take action against the fleas if a million mosquitoes showed up in Washington biting people the government would order a plane with DDT to spray the city if a million locusts or bees showed up in Washington, there would be a bee fighting plan. They would be in the war room saying, what shall we do to kill the bees and not kill the citizens? If a million black people show up in Washington, how will the government respond? Now listen, the forces of the world that join together seeking to destroy the nation also saw in the nation of Islam, small and insignificant as we are, the potential end of their own power if the nation succeeded. Do you know if we succeed in cleaning up 40 million people, the liquor business is hurt. The pork business is hurt. The cigarette business is hurt. The whore business is hurt. The dope business is hurt. If we just clean up our people, a whole lot of businesses fall. If we become Muslims, and fear only God, Go ahead. we become an army, the like of which has never been seen on the face of the earth. The government does not want to see that. So the government worked to destroy the nation of Islam. When 20 years ago, when the nation took on a change, the government was happy. Talk to me. Why was the government happy? Because we weren't talking nation anymore. We weren't setting up the flag of God anymore. We had become integrationists now. We wanted to carry the flag of the persecutors and the oppressors. The government was happy 
They don't mind you stop smoking and drinking. Just don't come up with an idea that supplants the idea of wickedness that rules America. I shall never forget, brothers and sisters, I was sitting in a movie theater in 1977 looking at a movie called The Lincoln Conspiracy. Listen, listen. And in that movie, Lincoln is really not killed by Booth. It was a conspiracy right within the government itself to knock him off because Lincoln was doing something to interfere with international bankers. I'm sitting in the theater, Come on. and while I'm looking at the movie, in my head I hear a voice saying, read Psalms. And in my mind I say, what Psalm? And the 83rd, a, a clicker went off, and it stopped at the 83rd Psalm. So when I left the theater, I told my wife, you know, I had a strange experience. I went home, picked up this Bible, read the 83rd Psalm. Keep not thou silence. O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may no longer be in their remembrance. There was a conspiracy to stop us from thinking of a nation. To make us want to come back and integrate with the very force of destruction of our lives. A conspiracy. Please. Just give me about 20 minutes. Please. Please. I'm literally begging you, just give me 20 minutes. Whenever you talk about conspiracy in America, they want to make you a looney tune. Some nut. Many scholars that I talk with say, oh, well, I don't believe in the conspiracy theory as though if you believe that there's a conspiracy against the rise of black people, that you're crazy. But let me ask you a question. If we believe that there is a devil or Satan who will act against God, and a conspiracy is when two or more people act in concert to perform and...